Let us explain the nature of the sea, and the reason why such a large mass of water is salt, and the way in which it originally came to be. The old writers who invented theogonies say that the sea has springs, for they want earth and sea to have foundations and roots of their own. Presumably, they thought that this view was grander and more impressive, as implying that our earth was an important part of the universe. For they believed that the whole world had been built up round our earth and for its sake, and that the earth was the most important and primary part of it. Others, wiser in human knowledge, give an account of its origin. At first, they say, the earth was surrounded by moisture. Then the sun began to dry it up. Part of it evaporated and is the cause of winds and the turnings back of the sun and the moon, while the remainder forms the sea. So the sea is being dried up and is growing less, and will end by being some day entirely dried up. Others say that the sea is a kind of sweat exuded by the earth when the sun heats it, and that this explains its saltness, for all sweat is salt. Others say that the saltness is due to the earth. Just as water strained through ashes becomes salt, so the sea owes its saltness to the admixture of earth with similar properties. We must now consider the facts which prove that the sea cannot possibly have springs. The waters we find on the earth either flow or are stationary. All flowing water has springs. By a spring, as we have explained above, we must not understand a source from which waters are ladled as it were from a vessel, but a first point at which the water which is continually forming and percolating gathers. Stationary water is either that which is collected and has been left standing, marshy pools, for instance, and lakes, which differ merely in size or else it comes from springs. In this case, it is always artificial. I mean, as in the case of wells, otherwise the spring would have to be above the outlet. Hence the water from fountains and rivers flows of itself, whereas wells need to be worked artificially. All the waters that exist belong to one or other of these classes. On the basis of this division, we can see that the sea cannot have springs, for it falls under neither of the two classes. It does not flow, and it is not artificial, whereas all water from springs must belong to one or other of them. Natural standing water from springs is never found on such a large scale. Again, there are several seas that have no communication with one another at all. The Red Sea, for instance, communicates but slightly with the ocean outside the Straits, and the Hyrcanian and Caspian seas are distinct from this ocean, and people dwell all round them. Hence, if these seas had had any springs anywhere, they must have been discovered. It is true that in straits, where the land on either side contracts an open sea into a small space, the sea appears to flow. But this is because it is swinging to and fro. In the open sea, this motion is not observed, but where the land narrows and contracts the sea, the motion that was imperceptible in the open necessarily strikes the attention. The whole of the Mediterranean does actually flow. The direction of this flow is determined by the depth of the basins and by the number of rivers. Maotis flows into Pontus and Pontus into the Aegean. After that, the flow of the remaining seas is not so easy to observe. The current of Maotis and Pontus is due to the number of rivers. More rivers flow into the Euxine and Maotis than into the whole Mediterranean with its much larger basin, and to their shallowness for we find the sea getting deeper and deeper. Pontus is deeper than Maotis, the Aegean than Pontus, the Sicilian Sea than the Aegean, the Sardinian and Tyrrhenic being the deepest of all. Outside the pillars of Hercules, the sea is shallow owing to the mud, but calm, for it lies in a hollow. We see, then, that just as single rivers flow from mountains, so it is with the earth as a whole. The greatest volume of water flows from the higher regions in the north, their alluvium makes the northern seas shallow, while the outer seas are deeper. Some further evidence of the height of the northern regions of the earth is afforded by the view of many of the ancient meteorologists. They believed that the sun did not pass below the earth, but round its northern part, and that it was the height of this which obscured the sun and caused night. So much to prove that there cannot be sources of the sea and to explain its observed flow.